Brad Pitt is here in 1991. He gained widespread attention as his swindling drifter J.D. in Thelma and Louise. Since then, his focus on diverse characters and his tendency to seek interesting projects. This month, he takes the lead in Troy based on Homer's The Iliad. Here is the trailer for the film. Is there no one else? Is there no one else? I am pleased to welcome Brad Pitt to this table for the first time. Thank you, Charlie. Great, great to see you. Yeah, great My being pleasure. here. Yeah. Uh, tell me about Achilles and why this was an interesting character to um, play. Well, it's, you know, it's one of the great iconic characters of history, of course, or, or certainly literature, classic literature. There's a, there was a lot there. There was a lot to go after. The physical demands, the, mm -hmm. the research, the, uh, uh, the personalization of the character. Um, he himself is, um, ho when, as, as Homer shapes him, he, um, we never quite know where he is until the end. He's, he does this really interesting thing where you, where you believe you, you know who Achilles is. He's this vain um, guy searching for glory. He'll then throw back he'll take you back in time to a scene when he was very benevolent and giving and so his his character is, is constantly unfolding the second thing he does which which i was really taken with is that that character is forged by experience and by his responses to experience which are often very extreme um, and sometimes despicably extreme yeah but this i understand more than adopting a dogma or a belief system um, um, that that it's okay to make mistakes it's okay yeah. to be a, a bastard at times if you can write that wrong if you can learn from and take it in fact it's very important yeah now, there's a great scene you're referring to with the mother i think that's when i mean you, you see right. early on the sense of julie of, christie it, it, exactly <laughs> it's, 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 you could choose a mother that's a great mother yeah uh there's a great scene and i mean and you get a sense of the ambition that drives it to want to be historical to right. want to have that kind of he knows he's a great warrior right and on the other hand there's this urging to do something else he's pulled by but you know in the end between the choice between sort of retiring into what would be a wonderful life versus the chance to be a historical character he can't resist to leave a mark he can't resist and and that is um i mean if i were to contemporize it it would uh, you can certainly make parallels to fame but um, uh, that, to me, signifies more uh, uh, a running from death, a running from oblivion, this idea to leave a monument, mm -hmm. even though you're not going to be able to enjoy it. What does it yeah, mean to you? Exactly, you're done. Exactly. You. But um, this, this push that um, for some kind of meaning, some kind of purpose, um, uh, they would write about how he, he, he wanted to surpass all men. He wanted to surpass the, the limits of mortality. And this is this thing that he was hungering for. And, and, it, and in the end, it became something very simple for him, certainly in the Iliad, as, as Homer constructs, um, where it's just an, an acceptance of his own humanity and, and the idea that we're all after the same thing, really. People are making a big deal about this notion. Uh, one, you were reluctant to, they had to talk you into taking this, number one. Uh, to some degree. Some degree. Right. You, you like the character, so... Yeah, very much. And, it, and you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> I get in my way a lot. And... Uh, um, it just seemed too obvious for, for a minute there. It was and then, the right moment for you to play that kind of role? Well, it was. I, I sat the bench for a couple of years. I hadn't done anything, so I was anxious to take something on that would be a little more um, difficult. We get to throw everything in, and this mm -hmm. one opened that up. What's the physical challenge? Well, the physical challenge is, um, you know, there's a current um, movement for, for, it's kind of the MTV cutting style where things are getting faster, harder, slash boom insert 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 and Wolfgang Peterson and Simon Crane who Simon comes from uh, Braveheart and uh, Saving Private Ryan I mean he's he's top of the game we're really adamant about us learning the fights and doing doing them ourselves so we could pull the camera back and you could see it unfold you could see the strategy you could see that's you know you're, you're going for a kill shot every time there's nothing superfluous you especially and see Van Damme and, about and, it all yeah, exactly yeah. you know it's it's um you're going for a kill shot, and you, you understand the chess more than the fight. And it, this one, by the time we get to the Achilles Hector fight, which to me is it, it's something, I think it's one of the great showdowns. 
and um, it it unfolds slowly, and it and it's it's almost balletic until, of course, you almost forget that someone's got to go. What's terrific about this movie also is is a it's the historical notion for coming from the Iliad and and others. It it is the characters that surround you. Yeah, Peter O'Toole. Whew. Eric Bana, Eric Bana, Brendan Gleeson, Brian Cox, Sean Bean, Rose Byrne, Orlando Bloom, uh, Diane Kruger, oh, on we go. Julie Christie. Julie yeah. and Julie Christie. I, I was afraid we were going to have a little Oedipus <laughs> subplot was going to read through there or something. She's, to me, just the pinnacle of the, you know, the late 60s, early yeah. 70s. She is, she's the bar. Yeah. Take a look at this. This is King Agamemnon, uh, Brian Cox plays, discussing the siege of Troy with Achilles. And you got to understand uh, that what is here is this notion of the warrior, yet there is conflict between the two of them because Achilles uh, does not have a lot of respect for the king or suggests he has different motives. Here it is. The soldiers won the battle. History remembers kings, not soldiers. Tomorrow, we'll batter down the gates of Troy. I'll build monuments to victory on every island of Greece. I'll carve Agamemnon in the stone. Be careful, King of Kings. First, you need the victory. I mean, that's a classic leading man, warrior leading man. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Good movie stuff. <laughs> yeah. But they have been wanting you to do this for a while. Did you just look for the right role, or you've been building to it, or you needed to do this other thing because you knew you could come to this at a certain moment in your life? I, I think it's more that. I think I, um, I, I really didn't understand what I had to offer more than what any, anyone else could do. It, it seemed to me we we're all kind of doing the same version, and I needed to, I guess, work some things out for myself. Plus, I come from the school, when I started, I come from the school of Mickey Rourke, Sean Penn. These yeah. guys were, these were the guys that flipped me out. These were the, and the 70s films, of course. So, and especially Sean in terms of doing character roles sure, that were Absolutely, powerful. so this, this this became my drive, this became my interest, and I wanted to see, you know, how I stood up, what I could find. That was original, that, there was a reason for me being there. When you, does it have something to be that this is the right time in terms of age? I mean, you've done these other things. And Possibly, I mean, certainly the impending midlife 40s, crisis. Know, yeah, it was a good motivator. Crisis, but, but in, you know, you always hear it's coming. And, and uh, um, so I wanted to see how far I could take it, if I really did it proper. And, and, uh, and it, too, I've, I've done a few films now, so it's time to up the ante. It's time to take it further or get out, I felt. Did this in any way invigorate a sense of wanting to act more? I mean, you've got three films coming out. Um, no, it still, it still felt the same. I just felt I, um, I graduated again in a way. Yeah. Um, but um, still went, in it, went about it the same and still, uh, still you know, tormented through it and, and, and still would like to change a few things on the way out. What do you mean by that change a few things? Well, there's always a couple, you know, yeah. that you want to... Well, as we were sitting through the, the, the composite, you said, I chunked that one. Yeah, I chunked that scene. What does that, that mean? It means I, I, I chunked that scene. I, I blew chunked that scene. Chunked it means that you, you blew yeah, it or... Yeah, or, I fluffed it. Meaning, um, uh, um, it could be better. I would love another shot at it. Yeah. You know, we, um, um, you and I are both architect, right. you know, architect junkies. And uh, I remember uh, when Disney, I mean, not Disney Hall, when Bill Bow in Spain opened yeah. up. I went to go see it. I stood across the water, and you see oh, yeah. this laid out the, uh, the Guggenheim there by Frank Gehry. And I literally, I got shivers. It was the sexiest thing I've ever seen. Cut to, I go home, and I see Frank, and he's standing on the same spot. It's a television program, and, and they're asking him about it. And he is standing there, and he's telling the story of how, standing on that spot, he looked and saw. And, he saw, and all I could see was what he wanted to change and how he, how he, how he blew it for the, for the clients. And, oh, my God, what yeah. had he done? So I, I think there's some kind of, uh, I think that fire is what, what, what pushes you, propels you to the next in some degree. So I don't take it so seriously, but. You also had to buff your, I mean, you really had to go through a certain kind of denial. Yeah. To get ready for this. The body's an amazing machine. It is an amazing machine. If you tell it, it needs to perform in these areas and you feed, the, feed it the proper fuel. And it, it needs to acclimate. It will acclimate. It will get to the point where it will, you injure it, you rip it, and it will repair itself stronger yeah. because you're telling it it needs to be able to, to carry this kind of weight. Uh, just take a look at this and we'll explain it afterwards. Here it is.
tell me a little bit about shooting that, I and mean, from the cinematographer's standpoint, what it was that, that you, you know, coming to that scene. Well, we had, uh, again, we had rehearsed that for months and months and months. Um, and it was shot late. It in, was shot at in, the end. In, the yeah, of in fact, we only had that fight scene to shoot left. We had five days left, and in one weekend, a hurricane came in, wiped out the wall of Troy, which yeah. is about the size of half a stadium, football stadium. And then also, I, I tweaked my tendon, so yeah. uh, so we were shut down. This is when you were down at the Baja in California. That's right. I mean, That's in, right. in Mexico. That's right. Yeah. And and how many times you shot at the end? And then so you had to we, take three months off after you. We had to take yeah, or two and a half months tendon. off it was, and then uh, we came back and shot that. Well, you just saw the fight. Actually, the dialogue was done right before the hurricane hit, <laughs> <laughs> and we had to come back. Yeah. The the idea uh, of the performance here. Um, how much how much did did you get from from some kind of exchange with with Peter and and Brian Cox and. Um, all of it, and and we certainly will get to uh, Peter after this. Yeah. But this at this point, scene. this point, it's um, it's it's all about vengeance. You know, um, we're dealing with Achilles, Achilles' heel, which is the metaphor for um, that weakness, which weakness, is actually yeah. becomes the strength. It's really we're talking about the, you make the you, you, we're talking about the heart. I right. dare say. Yeah. And. Um, um, it, here at this point, he he has um, Homer talked about when when I when I blindly set myself against another you when I draw this line that it actually becomes evil when I blindly set myself against and um, at this point here we wanted to see the vengeance you know we, this is a at this point we're we're dealing strictly with vengeance and and we as Americans I think are really steeped in the vengeance tale we we yeah. probably take it too far. I don't know it's so healthy. And at this point, that's what we're, we're dealing with. But we take it, I wanted to see rage to the point of insanity. Because in the Iliad, there's a great line where he talks about that he, t he wishes, he wishes Troy an, an evil death. He doesn't just say death, he says, he strictly says, he, evil. an evil death. Yeah. And it's very telling. And this is where you see the rage in which he, and what he does with Hector's body. Right after the death, right, that right. shows you the extension of the rage, right? Which still doesn't help him at all. And the vengeance. And so, of course, what we're the vengeance building, of his cousin. What we're building to, yes, the vengeance of his cousin, or cousin in our, right. in, he was a friend and, in the Iliad, right? And um, of course, what we're building to is the point where enemy and enemy sit down when Priam comes to him and asks for the big favor. Uh, and uh, set this up. We're going to see that now. Okay. This is my favorite moment in the film, and I think you've Great. said that it's your one of your favorite. Yeah, moments. yeah, it is for several reasons. Um, it's a, it's it's one of the greatest moments I've ever read, and it works in the script to David Benioff's credit. And it and I get to take a shot at this with Peter O'Toole. It's very special to me just to have that opportunity. I was really savoring that. And here at this point, um, of course, Peter O'Toole being. Um, playing King Priam, father of Hector, right. um, is coming to ask for a favor after I've done something completely right. despicable. We're not saying this simply in the well, interest of the film. But, yeah, but, but he's coming to ask something that, because out of the humanity of the king. That's right. And to pay respects to That's right. his son. And at that point, Achilles is completely walled off. He's impenetrable. He's invulnerable. Because he too has experienced enormous he, pain. He from is a loss. loss. He is suffering loss, and he, and the vengeance hasn't licked it. And and this is where we are. Priam comes in, and it's a scene scene constructed to disarm him, dismantle his ego in a way. It completely disarms him by the end of it, and it it doesn't come at Achilles with force, it, it, with, with which is what he understands. It comes at him with the weapons of peace, which are words. And through that, this line that separates you and I, or side versus side, my side, your side, um, Achilles Priam, gets erased. And he witnesses um, almost his own reflection. They, th and they form this kinship of suffering. They both have lost yeah. what they loved. And from there, it's a real turning point in our film. Now, it's a turning point in the vengeance tale. It takes it a step further, and it's, it's really the point of our world. Having said that, and let me just set it up one okay. even to a higher level. Think of the great moments you've had on film. Uh -huh. Where does this sit? Um, certainly, you know, I don't know where it'll add up, but certainly from experience, yeah. it was, it was why I wanted to do what we do here. It was. It's it why was, you want to act. Yeah, and you don't get them. They're few and far between, but 
you keep chasing these moments. Moments brought together by the nature of the scene, the moments scene. by the fact that you're Peter across O'Toole. from an actor that you have enormous admiration right. for. Directing, a director lets, lets us go at it, and it takes, it, you really, we are feeding off of, of each other, and that's, that's the best of scenarios. It's a great scene. Roll tape, here it is. Let me place two coins on his eyes for the boatman. If I let you take her, it doesn't change anything. You're still my enemy in the morning. You're still my enemy tonight. But even enemies can show respect. But even enemies can show respect. Yeah, that was the line that hooked me. Yeah. yeah. What do you get from working with Peter O'Toole? I was just going to say, I love him. I, it just takes me right back. Just to, sitting here watching it. Yeah, just to, just to have, uh, have had that moment. But Peter O'Toole himself, beyond the legend, is, is a, he's a true force. He's a force of nature. He's, um, he's, he's, he comes from a different school that I don't understand. He's, um, he's got this eloquence and he's this gift of storytelling. And uh, he's just a laugh to be around. And he'll put you under the table, I'll tell you that. Put you under the table? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. He's, I mean, I think he's operating. Yeah, I know because you look at a guy, and just he took some of his stomach. Yeah, he's got like a third of his stomach left, yeah. and maybe a quarter of his liver. But it'll keep you up doing. late and put you under the table. It'll put you under. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me take you back to Thelma and Louise. Mm -hmm. You said that was one of the roles you chunked. No, I chunked that scene. That scene. That scene, scene you showed. Yeah. Just. Yeah. Well, that was a great scene. I mean, that was um, a scene it was, that it grabbed was a, everybody. It was a really. It was a well-written scene. And uh, I just, I didn't elevate the scene at all. It was really well written on page. And that there, I just kind of flatlined it. What did it do for you, that movie? Well, it, you know, it opened the doors for me. And, and you know, half this business is, is the lotto. There's a lot of talented people out there. And because of that, I, I've been given the opportunity to grow and, you know, hone the craft, so to speak. Um, but Ridley Scott, giving me that shot with Gina, uh, opened the door, let me in the game, that put me in the ring. Did that start the fame game too? Um, I guess to some degree, uh, yeah, to some degree, but you know, you still gotta punch at it. Then Redford came along. Uh-huh. And said, can you fly fish, son? <laughs> Not really, actually, <laughs> say. a friend of mine, um, Dermot Mulroney, we'd love the script. Yeah. So we we went out and made a tape of doing some of the scenes. We had a, a friend of ours shoot it and, yeah. and, and sent it to him um, to get in the door. First you had to learn how to fly fish. Yeah, well that, you know, that, that's one of the perks of what we do. We get to pick up something usually um, on every film. And uh, what I have learned is you can learn anything. Some's gonna t some, some of it's gonna take a little longer than the others, but we can, we have the ability to learn anything. You're interesting about this whole fame business, though. I mean, you know, it's, it, it comes about in part because of craft and, and skill and experience. It also comes about because it's the nature of the business you're in. It also comes about because of DNA, the way you, one looks, all of that. Right. Do you shy away from it? Do you accept it and say, it's part of what I am and what I do, and so therefore I'll keep my pride? You know, how do you handle that? Um, um, I used to wrestle with it a lot more than I do now. I accept it pretty much yeah. for what it is. And, um, you know, it, it, it just became much easier when I gave up on wanting understanding. Yeah. When I wanted, wanting justice in a way. Um, what do you mean by that? Just wanting the record to be right, set yeah. the record straight. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so at some point you come to the place where they're going to take the pictures and they're going to write pretty much stories that they want to write. Right, and, and and I can't go around. It all comes the out in the wash, as we would say back. It's home. a kind of game. Yeah, it's a, oh, it's a definite game, no question. Um, Clooney does it best. He's the best I've seen. Why is that? He just has um, one. He knows how to enjoy it more than anyone else, and he knows how to play with it. And uh, his quick wit, you know, he's ahead of the game. Seven did what for you? Seven, well, it, it hooked me up with David Fincher, yeah. who's um, 
I just I love the guy. He's, he's yeah. become a great friend, and uh, and uh, I love what he does. And it kind of uh, took me down another road. Um, I think that started with California. California was the first time I tried to do some kind of yeah. character, something away from the where it was heading. Uh, I tried to go take a right turn. And Seven, Seven had this feeling, this color of the '70s films that I loved. That what Fincher was after, and yet it was something new. And and um, I don't know, Fincher. Fincher could be Orson Welles as far as I'm concerned. He's, he's an amazing. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, and bright and. Very and you bright. and Morgan to work with Morgan. Uh huh. Well, oh, I a um, great experience. Fight Club. Fight Club again, David Fincher. Yeah. Yeah. And Edward Norton, also become good friends with since. Some have said that that was that there was, you know, that Fight Club showed a part of you that was part of you. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We were having a laugh at that phase. I was really trying to, um, you know, we start out with acting 101. We right. um, fill in the scene, scene breakdown. Um, what does your character want? At that point, I was trying to, I was getting too caught up in that. I was trying to throw all that out the window. And it was an experiment for me to see just what happens on the day. What do you whip out on the day? And uh, so, because of that, maybe it is a little more. I, um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I sure appreciate a little irreverence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then at some point, you, Ocean's Eleven, and... I may be leaving something out. Ocean's Eleven. Clooney and Company. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, you know, we're under... None of these... Go ahead. Well, I was just going to... I was going to throw in Soderbergh because he... He and Georgia Partners. He and Georgia Partners, and he's one of the great... Uh, one of our great directors, contemporary directors as well. So it's really a storyteller's medium, and we're a small component of it. It's really Acting up to the storyteller. Yeah, it really is by the time you... He meld it with the attitude. Does that make you want to direct at some point? No. Not at all? No, You're so all. firm and smart, sharp about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a daunting task. And, I, and two, I think there's so many good people doing it right now that I'm not needed. Yeah. <laughs> if I could but, be, and, and, I could have such a ego. And my sense is that, I mean, you're enjoying acting. I'm enjoying you're, it. And, you're not, and, and you don't know where you can take it. But as, as you quote Frank Gehry, your friend right. and mine, if you know where the journey is going, then you don't want to take it. Yeah. Something the, like, what did he say? Yeah, if, if you know where it's going, and then... If you know where it's going to end, you don't want to take it, or something it's like not, that. It's not yeah. worth exploring. So, um, yeah, to some extent. And if I was going to take in, take on some kind of job as, as commander-in-chief, as you must be, it would probably be more in a building aspect or something like that. I would enjoy, I would enjoy much more. Tell me about you and architecture. Um, I don't know what it is. Well, I do. I know a little bit what it is. I've always jonesed on it. I've always been... a bit of a junkie for it and and it's it's one of the few art forms that you can be inside that you can experience it um, by being smaller than it mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I have a, a strict belief that if architecture has ability to lift your soul that we are susceptible to our surroundings um, I think a prison cell would yeah, be the, yeah. would be the, the opposite um, and that there are these people now who are who are leading us to the future, and and I'll tell you the the, the misperception um, of architecture is that it's all aesthetics, and it's really not aesthetics. When you sit with these guys, these masters like Geary and um, Hadid and Cool House, cool house yeah. sure, sure, all of them have yeah, sat at this table. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I've watched. Uh, yeah, um, it, there's the science is first, the study, the um, the study of how um, uh, people will move through the space, how yeah. how, how they'll want to use it, how they um, um, uh, the weather, the climate, how we can harness um, air through. How can how can we better people's lives? And that is the science, and that's where architecture starts. And finding, as Frank did with titanium, you know, well, at the whole, Bell Bell, the whole notion of of what you can and and I think you have shown some real interest in this. Uh, according to what I've read with Frank, I mean, if you go to his place in Los Angeles, it's uh, an experiment. It's an experiment, yeah. you know, and you can see an how open-ended experiment, and and the the impact of computer technology, especially to him, with his creativity, mm -hmm. 
you know, just opened up a whole new... I mean, he couldn't have done what he did at Bilbao. He, he couldn't have done what he did at no. Disney without the impact of the technology that now makes his ability to see how it's possible. These are pioneers. He blew the lid off the box, literally. Yeah. And yes, his house is one big jam session, yeah, isn't yeah. it? You can just yeah. see him trying this out right, in this right, corner and right. trying that yeah. out in this corner. But um, and what's great about him is he, this is a guy in his 70s. Yeah. You know, Hit when who, to was... talk to him, his enthusiasm for the work and for the ideas and, and for, for others' pushing, work. Uh -huh. And for others' work, too. Uh -huh. And the future, where we can go. They show us the future. They show yeah. us how we can better our lives, how we can, how we can live. That's why Disney Hall was so important for, for L.A. And the achievement of the sound quality is just stunning. Right. Yeah. Immediately became an iconic symbol. And yeah. yet now there's, I think there's 13 acres around where they're already, it's already yeah, been hijacked exactly. by developers. And but how do, you, and how do you take this fascination, we'll come back to movies in a moment, this fascination with it, uh, in terms of what you do. I mean, because to look at, I saw one story with some terrific pictures, and it, what it showed to me was, an, an, A, an aesthetic. It did show an aesthetic, but it also showed some real sense of feeling about material, about stone, like, yes. and about wood, and about uh, other materials. Yes, I, I, everyone's kind of got their moniker or their vernacular, and, and I, I'm certainly not throwing myself in the lot with, with these people we've mentioned, but... Um, 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 I guess I'm, I'm always looking for a, a harmony, a harmony of materials. Um, I come from more of a, a Bauhaus understanding, which was all about materials. Let the let the let the the grain and the wood be the decoration. Don't you don't have to frill it up. Let there's beauty here in nature, and yeah. harness that and show that. And so uh, me myself, I'm always kind of looking for harmony, and then I always always seem to be looking for a way out. I always got yeah. exits. But when you, you exit, meaning what? Me, exit meaning to, freedom. I don't. Yeah, me I, either. Well, right, right. I want the walls to go away, and the connection to outside as well. And that's right. You, in fact, um, you, you, and the use of light and all of that. All of it. It's all about light, and how the light bounces around the place, and I mean, have or you not. Ever, have you ever thought that? I mean, you. Do you look at acting and say, "This is what I was born to do. This is what I should be doing"? For mm. a whole combination of circumstances. No, not at all. Um, 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 in fact, I get a little uh, frustrated because I think there's so many things to do. Yeah, there too. Yeah, yeah, there's so much to do. But where do you think you are in terms of, of some sense of enthusiasm for it? For acting? acting yeah. For acting? Um, I got a new Jones couple, for it. The two years, you know, you need to go away from it, or I needed to go away from it to fill up again. And I, and I got a Jones for it again here with, uh, with Troy. How do you think, how did that happen? Um, we, we, um, uh, because you're kicking into another zone too. I need to incubate. I need to sit for a bit, and and ideas start coming, things start forming, and and I find direction, and that's always the most exciting time to me. Like direction, by that I mean a line to follow, and that's how I equate it with with any of the arts. When you find a line, you find something that you, you start following that line because it means something to you. You don't know where it's going, and um, that's certainly how I equate it to acting as well as trying to find something in the characters but I'm I am wholeheartedly interested in the future just where it's going what what we in, can in do the impact of technology and where we're going Even and where science is going and, and yes and certainly um, with alternative energies we're way behind we're way behind Sweden's kicking our ass this story today and let's look at this this sure. is today's New York Times U.S. is losing its dominance in the sciences. Well, there the United it is right States there. has started to lose its worldwide dominance in critical areas of science and innovation, according to federal and private experts who point to strong evidence like prizes awarded to Americans and the number of papers in major professional journals. Foreign advances in basic science offer rival even to see. That's going to kick us in the ass. It really is. I mean, that and, attitude and, and, right there. People like Andy Grove and Bill Gates you know, have been preaching this for, for mm -hmm. and you know, it's a out couple there. of years. Little Sweden is kicking our ass ass yeah. and uh, the new technologies are so exciting so exciting yeah. vehicles powered by magnetic pull and on and on it goes on and on it goes and we're not investing in it we're not pushing that we should be I think we got a responsibility as a superpower we got a responsibility to teach as well yeah. you don't talk much about politics no I don't it's Stupid. not my um, I, I'm, I'm very prone to step into shit so yeah. you know I, I <laughs> I don't yeah. pretend to have all the information, yeah. but um, I, I do pay attention. Yeah, but here's something. I mean, I don't want to I say this not at the risk of embarrassing or sounding it's like right. I'm patronizing you. 
you know, there was some sense that that you what comes across, and, th and it comes across especially here in this piece. This is a piece. I don't, I don't know if you've read it or whether you like no, it. No, I haven't. I haven't it's a even very seen good it yet. piece. It's it's a Vanity Fair, which is coming out, and it's by uh, Leslie Bennett, uh -huh. and it's she captures what, uh, in print an extraordinary sense of a reflective and interesting mind at work. I mean, all you got to do is read it and, and make your own judgment about it in terms of someone who really has who's really on a journey and is enjoying it, you know, yet at the same time understands with a kind of sharp eye of realism about the nature of the game. Okay. You know? Okay. Now, I'll read that goes, what I think. But part of it is this notion, too, that is there any part of you, because what comes across here is an intelligent, very bright, curious mind reflecting our conversation. Is there any part of you that sort of got characterized or stereotyped or, or whatever because of looks sure. and acting so sure. that people had no real sense and did that frustrate you? Well, I'm also more in command of my ex exploration as I, as I get older. I, I really appreciate getting older so far anyways. Yeah, so I don't, I don't I'll, trade, anyway. I'll take wisdom over youth any days. Really? But absolutely. But um, also I, watch, I like watching the new younger generations come in. Yeah. You see exactly where the head and came. You mean the 20, 21 year yeah, olds? Yeah, sure. And try to tell them when they listen or they don't. Yeah. But um, well, did people try to tell you and you listened or did? I probably didn't. I don't know if anyone did. But yeah, to some degree, I mean, um, um, not given, I'm sure if half of it was um, projections on me um, for the way I looked. And also, um, and half of it was me just from not, um, um, not, not really speaking up. You know, staying, I was much more internalized, much more um, inside. Simply because that was the nature of your um, it's, it's, temperament, or it was just where you were in your own uh, a little, journey. A little of both. I think it's a um, part of my upbringing. Um, um, we said a lot with our silences, yeah. and uh, um, also, um, I always want to. I want to learn the area before I before I. Before I step in and speak up, I how are you influenced, and what's the fact? How do you factor in this sort of rather what appears to me a remarkable marriage, and 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 peace? Same thing. We we always called it a an exploration as well, and uh, the marriage itself. The marriage itself. And Jen and I have been where we've succeeded most at getting everything on the table. That's that's been our law at home. It's been about our our, our only law. Everything has got to end up on the table. It may take us a little while to get there, and and um, there's a great freedom that comes from that, and we become better friends because of it. Just put it on the table. Yeah, it's got to get on the table, even if it, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Yeah. It's got to get. So it's got to end it's up so on the table. It's so true about everything. Isn't it? It's, I mean, it is. It is so basic and simple and fundamental. That's right. And about living, about your own analysis of yourself, about everything. That's right. And and it's. I'm telling you, it's freeing. It's free in, in the end, and because we love each other, um, it can be accepted. Is it a complementary relationship, or does she share your passions for, in terms of your own sense of art and architecture and garden? No, we're kind of after two different things, and yet, um, um, no, I don't think she quite understands what it, what I'm <laughs> after. And I don't think I quite understand what she's after, yeah. but but it's interesting to me because I don't. Do you regret at all? I mean, you were a, a, a couple of weeks away from a degree in journalism at Missouri when you decided. Nope. There's a line in adaptation film yeah. I, I love from. Uh, you know who was here? It was, who was that? Kaufman. Oh, I would. Yeah. You love would what? I love his his writing. I would. Yeah. I would love to end now, up in see, something like what's that. What's amazing? Uh, Sean Penn and I, as you know, a friend, and did a 60 Minutes profile. He said the same thing to me. And the best that I know, love Charlie Cole. Yeah, he's on to something. Yeah, he is he's um, on to something. He uh, he's mixing it up, and, and again, it's that, that 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 new voice, that new direction, that new vernacular, and his stuff is painfully, brutally honest. Yeah. I, I I adore him. I'm I'm a huge fan of his, and would love to end up in something with that kind of tone. Do you seek out? And it, having those ideas, do you seek someone out like that and say? Yeah, you do. You throw a, a few darts at him, and yeah. if if um, oh, you are now, in fact. <laughs> yeah, and if yeah, here's a, here's the calling card. <laughs> and if it matches up, you know.
they'll respond. And if not, it's you know it's not the right match. But you sought out Frank Gehry. Yeah, in a way, yes, I certainly did. Because you wanted to explore, you wanted to learn, you wanted yeah, to get just, sort of get blew my mind. rub up against somebody that was mind. doing interesting things. I found his stuff so I found it sexy, yeah. and 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 it's something that's um, an inanimate object. It, it had movement. It was moving. It was like music. I I I. I I, I, I can't do it justice, sir. I found it. In this magazine, Leslie Bennett, uh, again, a terrific piece, I thought. You said, I'm not a big proponent of happiness. No, I think it's overrated. <laughs> yeah, I really do. Now, what does that mean? I'm, I'm not talking about a piece. I'm talking about happiness. Um, um, because this is such an emphasis on that we've got to be happy, happy all the time. Happy, if we're not exactly. happy, then so, something's wrong. In other words, wrong. not to be happy is okay, is what you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. You've got to have it. You, got to have the other to appreciate any kind of happiness or to understand any kind of happiness I'm, yeah I'm it's overrated how much in control of your life have you been and how much of it has been um, I don't know percentage I'm probably you know um, I'm probably about 50 50 here's why I asked you take someone like Tom Cruise uh -huh, uh -huh. you have a sense that that he's a hundred percent right in control That's and, right. and a lot of people could look at it and say He's controlled it very well. Absolutely, and he's uh, he's the best I've seen on the business side. He's the best I've seen. Um, me, it's not my particular interest. You basically said money and business per se don't interest uh, you. No, I, listen, I'll, I'll take some money. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna. Well, this I'm is good because you down. take money and get a piece of the action. Yeah, though. sure, sure. Yeah. But um, I also want to be um, I want to be open to what what comes across. I want to be open for. Th the surprises. The best stuff I've ever found has, has always been surprises. Me too. Especially it's in specific. acting and in life. And, and so I want to be open for that. And then, if it doesn't work out so well, I, I have enough faith that I'll figure it out. Who's had the most influence on you? I got it. I still go back to Rourke and Penn because yeah. that's when I really started focusing. Because of the way they were doing it and the choices they yeah, made and, there's this and the characters they created. An amazing juxtaposition of. of Toughness and hardness, with also this, this um, softness of soul and heart, and indeed, and, and it's a, it's see that's Achilles the most too, difficult, and that's Achilles. Yeah, you can trace, you can pretty much trace everything back to those two guys for me. Yeah, yeah. Hector and Achilles, or, or, or no, 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 anything I've done. Back to back to Pan or Rourke. Yeah. This one, I actually going into it, I started, I, I drew a little from. Nicole Kidman from The Hours. I thought she had, she had oh, great internal it. turmoil. Yeah. And also I used Weber from um, um, uh, Sacramento Kings. He's Chris got, Weber. yeah, he's got this, he, he on the court, he's, he's a great warrior on the court, but you also see he's in, he's in constant conflict. There's a, 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 an immense rage there, and there's also a great warrior's heart there. So I actually used him as a starting point, as a springboard. I, 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 there's a great tone there, and you could you could probably find it in there. When you're with guys like Redford, who's directing you, or Norton, who's a colleague, uh, O'Toole, Brian Cox, do you guys talk about acting, and do you, is there time for that, and does it influence you? Do you? I mean, I, mm -hmm. if you if you're if you're drinking with Peter O'Toole, not a lot. I, it's I think we absorb each other. Yeah. And then we tell war stories. Thing. Yeah, yeah. I see that more. Well, I I think we're constantly studying each other in a way, but not in a. Um, uh, yeah, it would have to be osmosis. Does the sound? Does the diction side come easy to you? No, that's a, that's not my strong point. And uh, I've done a few of them now where people think that it comes easy to me. That that. And that, so, how do you make it look easy? Oh, I, I work. I, I, worked very hard at it. I gotta work mm -hmm. and I gotta work and I gotta first find the music in it. I, that I can understand. I gotta find the melody. And you gotta hear it. I gotta hear it and I gotta understand I gotta understand the song. How do you get there? Um, repetition and then I need someone to come in and, and show me the notes. Meaning the, the sounds. The specific sounds. Um, um, certainly when I came out here I, I, my accent was I still swallow my words, but most of it, you know, we kind of just kind of talk like this. I wouldn't really enunciate much, and, and you know, just kind of talk like that. <laughs> you like the physicality of acting? Yeah, I do. I do. I feel better there. I feel. 
I just feel it in my body. The, yeah. yeah. You're at one with your body. Um, I don't know. I just can feel, again, the music. If that makes yeah. any sense whatsoever. Any passion to create, to, I mean, you think of the architect, any passion for you to do, to combine this great avocation you have, which is an interest in, in the, in the vis visual and design and architecture and understanding and also the future. Is there a story of a great architect that would... Well, that's good. That'd be, that would go back to the Fountainhead. No, no, it is. But would you redo that? Um, would there you have thought actually, about it? There was it actually talk your mind? about The thing is, it's so dense and complex, it would have to be a six-hour movie or... I don't, I don't know how you do it under four and not lose, really lose what uh, Ayn Rand was after. But does it interest you? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Actually, I believe Oliver Stone's on it right now. Is that right? Yeah, as a possibility. But it's, to make it as a feature film? Yeah, po as a possibility, yes, as a feature film. Yeah. You're also doing Mr. Miss Smith. Is that the title? Yeah, that's right. What is that? That is, I'll be interested to see how this one works because it's a, we're trying to combine genres of an action, genre, uh, a romantic comedy, a black comedy, and uh, I'll just—it'll be—I'll be curious to see how it works. But it's this great metaphor for marriage. I mean, no, it's, 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 two, the two whole thing is a metaphor. Here's the metaphor. Here's the message. I understand. I mean, it's about two people, two assassins, and they're to kill each other. Well, it's about a husband and wife are trying to kill each other, right there, which makes me laugh. <laughs> and then um, um, it actually sparks. They find the relationship again through this um, passion. And uh, and then they got to defend the marriage from the outside influences. So it, there's a if it works, there's a real fun. Would you do a movie that. like that with Jennifer? Um, I, we would have to be careful. We actually talked about it on this one, and you know, you look back at history; it's there to, for us to I learn it. from. It, it's Tom the and Nicole. Odds, in terms the odds of, are against couples working together. It so really, it, it, what would is, have to it, be it is that it's cherry picked. Why is it that? Uh, why is it so rarely know. work? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it worked pretty good with Beatty and Benning in Bugsy. Right, right. But that was, but we that was before they were married, I think. Oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. That's no, what they met there. Didn't work well for Nicole right and there. Tom and some thought. And sometimes eyes wide it does. Open. Sometimes it doesn't. Maybe it's our, 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 we know too much about the couple already, and it's thrown onto the movie. I don't know why, why that is, but I just know the odds are against us. If you weren't doing this, what would you most want to do? I'd like to build uh, or just make things. My, I've, I've kind of reduced it down to this from here on out. I just want to make things. Just make things. Yeah, just make yeah. things. Whatever that entails, wherever that, that takes me. You said another intriguing thing, which I admire a lot. You said, you know, I'd, lo uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to have lots of kids. Yeah, I do. I really I, I love this idea of all these different personalities, you know, bouncing off each other, and they got each other to learn from. And I feel like I'm at the time now where I, I got something to tell them, so. In other words, you've absorbed your own experience, and so therefore... Yeah, yeah, and, and I could help them, I could show them around. I could do a good job showing them around. And here's the kicker. This is, again, this piece. You'd love for it to be all girls. Yeah, me, myself. I'm just, <laughs> I know Because I'm gonna, you don't want what? Good. Well, I'm just going to screw up the guys a little bit, and they're going to be pissed <laughs> off at me for years, and I'm going to have to yeah. go through that. But... Um, yeah, and I'm just a sucker for just a sucker for the girls. Great to have you here. It's great being here. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me, Charlie. Brad Pitt, Troy is the film. Um, it's it has everything that you could want for an, an epic film. It's a great story. Um, a terrific performance by him. Uh, a great supporting cast, as you saw, Brian Cox and. O'Toole and and here's Orlando Bloom who plays Paris Bad and uh, who plays Hector and then there's a great conflict between two proud men, Achilles and Hector. It has all the elements of the film. Uh, it is summertime coming. And may I say, directed by Wolfgang Peterson, who was really responsible for for keeping this whole juggernaut on track. I thank you for doing this again. It's great to see you, and uh, we'll do it again. Great, thanks, Charlie. Pleasure. Thank you. Brad Pitt for the hour. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.